by David Sirota, who is the uh, author of Hostile Takeover. And before we get into the uh, book, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, Hugo Gurdon was talking about, and that's K Street hedging the bets on the outcome of the next election in 2006 and 2008. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's not surprising, uh, as, as my book goes into, that the, the corruption on Capitol Hill, the influence of big money on Capitol Hill, crosses both parties. And so uh, I think that, that the overt nature of K Street uh, uh, moving a little bit towards the Democratic Party is not that surprising, because they haven't necessarily divested themselves fully of Democrats, even though there was the K Street project. In other words, that that they're reasserting themselves with the Democratic Party, I think, uh, uh, shouldn't be shocking because I think big money has always played an influence and continues to play an influ influence on both parties, regardless of the high-profile nature of the recent corruption scandals as focused on the Republican Party. The name of the book, Hostile Takeover, How Big Money and Corruption Conquered Our Government and How We Take It Back. The re reading through this book, how surprised would people be to see that, um, in, in your opinion, uh, that there is big money in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? Well, I don't think people will be surprised. I think that what they will be surprised about is how deeply rooted corruption really is. As, as I argue, you know, we tend to think of corruption as Jack Abramoff, Duke Cunningham, uh, and the scandals that we read about in the paper. And as the, as the book makes the point, that, that corruption really is far deeper than that. The worst forms of corruption are what's legal, what's happening every day. Uh, uh, in fact, I would actually argue that corruption is even how we frame the debate. So, for instance, uh, uh, on energy policy, uh, as, as, as gas prices hit $3 a gallon, as, as ExxonMobil reports $8 billion in profits while they're giving their CEO a $400 million retirement package, up until very recently, the terms of the debate have been essentially what tax breaks to give to what energy companies. Up until very recently, any policies that would actually challenge big money, in this case big oil, like a windfall profits tax, like a federal price gouging law, that's been out of the debate. And so I would argue that it, that's out of the debate not accidentally. It's deliberate. It's deliberate from a Congress that is in part owned by the big oil companies. So if um, there is nothing illegal, no price gouging or anything like that going on, how does Congress get involved with ExxonMobil, for example, who wants to give their retiring CEO a $400 million retirement package? Well, uh, two ways. First of all, I'm not sure that there's nothing illegal going on. Uh, I, in the book, I document how internal oil industry memos in the late 90s and early 2000s showed that the oil companies were trying to uh, uh, limit their refining capacity in order to create artificial bottlenecks. So have we seen a, a serious investigation into that? No, we haven't. Have we seen a, uh, a, a consideration of a windfall profits tax? That's a way to, to try to rein in uh, price gouging through a windfall profits tax. I think, you know, have we seen even a discussion about really repealing already passed tax cuts for companies like ExxonMobil. Well, we saw it. It lasted about three days. Now we're not talking about it again. Why? Again, because companies like ExxonMobil have a huge amount of discretionary money to throw around Washington to make sure that these policies never get debated. We're talking with David Sirota, author of Hostile Takeover, uh, How Big Money and Corruption Conquered Our Government and How We Take It Back. And uh, we want for you to, uh, we'd like for you to get involved in the conversation, and uh, we'll show you the numbers on the screen in just a few seconds. First, we're going to take this call from Columbus, Ohio, on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I agree with you. There's big money in both parties. But the Republicans seem to be op. I mean, just obscene with the manner in which they allow the abuse to be, take place in government. And I want to get to a couple of points. They're always talking about the free market, the free market. But once the consumer or the voter has an opportunity to take advantage of the market, they always change the rules, like the free market in employment. Okay, when, when, when the demand for labor is high, then they let... The, uh, the immigrants come across. They change the rules all the time. Uh, they'll say uh, 
free market in, in oil. Well, once it was regulated, they said, we're going to deregulate it. Then they changed the rules all the time to cut down the supply. I mean, if people don't see this here, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost obscene what they do to They, they change the rules, but it's always the free market when it's the advantage for the corporate, uh, off, uh, uh, the corporate enterprises. But when it's time for the consumer to take advantage of the, uh, the environment, the, um, I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, financial environment, it, they change the rules every time. I would, I would tend, to, I would absolutely agree with you. And as my book goes into, one of the great myths uh, in this country, uh, pushed by big money interests, is that we actually live in a free market. Uh, here's a part of my book which actually goes into exactly this question. Uh, in one breath, politicians tell us that price controls, for instance, for prescription drugs are bad. That's that's anti-free market. Yet they pass restrictive patent laws that an anti-free market provision that keep drug prices high. Uh, they tell us regulations against energy price gouging would be uh, against the free market. But government uh, handouts, taxpayer handouts to big oil companies, uh, you know, a subsidy, not a free market policy, we're told that that's good. Protecting American jobs, that's against the free market. That's what we're told. We shouldn't, pat we shouldn't try to protect American jobs. But government helping companies outsource through subsidization, outsourcing through subsidization, we're told that that's fine. That's fine. Forget about the free market when it comes to that. So, in other words, you're absolutely right. The entire mantra of the concept that we live in a free market right now, that is, I would argue, a myth. When the free market only serves to work for corporate interests but doesn't work for ordinary citizens, you should know that we don't actually live in a free market. We live in a rigged market. Next up is Yucca Valley, California, on our line for Republicans. Good morning. Uh, yes. You know, we're talking about corruption. When we uh, find out that a lot of our representatives and our politicians are come out of the corporate world to represent us, is there anything that the, the American people or the honest politicians that are there to serve the people, which I think is the, the precept of getting into politics, is there anything we can do to, or, or people like you, watchdogs, to expose this, and I know the media won't, that, that their hands are still in the corporate world, and I mean their hands are out, because they seem to, when they do their tenure, and I hate to say this, but we throw them out, like our administration right now being so connected up with the oil that, shoot, we put a man on the moon in 1969 with what is now antiquated uh, technology. It seems to me, you know, going back to the last speaker who used a lot of words, but he seems to put down the ethanol, uh, oh, the eth ethanol concept. This is the breadbasket of America. Why can't we have a have these politicians or or somebody wake up to the fact to let the American people, if we develop our energy sources here, and there's many different ways that that I know they don't want us to ha be independent of them because we're on their corporate tit. David Sirota. Well, I think the, the, the caller asks a good question. How do we actually take it back? As I told a friend of mine recently, if I had written this book 10 years from now, I would probably change the subtitle to read uh, uh, How Big Money and Corruption Conquered Our Government, period. I wouldn't have a section on how we take it back. You're absolutely right. Uh, there is a lot of uh, corporate influence in government. The revolving door is spinning wildly out of control. We're now seeing uh, to the point where lobbyists are actually running for office and winning. Senator John Thune, for instance, was a corporate lobbyist before becoming a senator. Uh, you know, Mitch Daniels in Indiana, he was a uh, executive vice president of a giant drug company. So you're absolutely right. How do we take it back? Well, I would argue fundamentally that we need campaign finance reform and not the kind of campaign finance reform we've seen. I think we need public financing of elections. I think we need to give people who want to run for office a way to run where they don't have to be specialists in shaking down big money interests. Now I know the criticism of that is, well, it's welfare for politicians. Well, my answer to that is, you get what you pay for. Somebody's going to pay for these elections. Somebody is paying for these elections. 
Big money interests are paying for these elections, and Congress works for big money interests. If we want a government that works for us, we have to finance our campaigns. If we can spend a billion or a billion and a half dollars a year promoting democracy abroad, I say we can afford to spend at least half that promoting it here at home. Next up is Knoxville, Tennessee on our line for independence. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Sirota. I appreciate your book. Uh, I agree with you. And I wanted to point out to the people that the biggest contributors in 04 to the uh, Bush campaign was the pharmaceuticals. And then we've had the prices go up and up. And the second biggest contributors were the, uh, were the energy and oil companies to the Republicans. So if people wonder why gas prices are going up, uh, they should look at that. And um, there used when Clinton left office, there were 12 large uh, oil companies, and the Justice Department under our current administration has allowed them all to merge. So now there's only five big energy companies like Conoco, Phillips, and all that, and there's not the competition. And I want you to comment on how that's affected gas prices because there's just not the competition there used to be. Well, I, you're absolutely right. Uh, consolidation uh, and vertical integration in the in the energy industry has been a huge problem. Uh, it's something that uh, that was moving moving forward under the Clinton administration, where but it has absolutely accelerated under the Bush administration. Uh, the stats about how fast it's accelerated uh, are in my book, uh, but. But here's a telling example of exactly how in the pocket of the oil companies our government really is. I think it was two years ago, uh, President Bush had the nerve to nominate a, tech, a Chevron Texaco lawyer to head the Federal Trade Commission. This is the commission that's supposed to be investigating oil industry price gouging. This is the commission that's supposed to regulate and prevent anti-competitive anti-free market mergers in the oil industry. It is again now headed by a former Chevron Texaco lawyer. So this shows you the, how mundane and how regular and how deeply rooted corruption is in our government. As I said at the beginning of this, it's not necessarily what's illegal that's the worst forms of corruption. It's what's legal. Who better though to know how business law should be um, adjudicated than somebody who's been in business? Well I would argue that that there's a problem with allowing folks who come straight out of a regulated in industry to become the regulator. So I think you're right. Business experience is important. However, I would also say as a side note that there are plenty of uh, experts who work in the nonprofit and watchdog world that I would argue would be better. But even, but you're right. Folks who have business experience is important. The question is, should the revolving door be allowed to spin immediately? Should you be allowed to immediately go from a regulated industry to a regulator? I would say no. And in Montana, the state where I now live, we have a ballot measure that would prevent, for instance, lobbyists, I'm sorry, uh, legislators from immediately becoming lobbyists. In Congress, I know that the, the law is something, around, something along the lines of you can't lobby your office uh, for, a, for, I think it's about a year. Uh, the problem is you can co-lobby everybody else's office. So the point is, is that you're right. Business experience is important. I would say it's not the only factor. Right now, it seems to be the only factor. But what's more important is how, how fast the revolving door moves. It's almost like nobody even thinks twice about it anymore. Next up is Kingston, Oklahoma, on our line for Republicans. You're talking with David Sirota, author of Hostile Takeover. Uh, Mr. Schroeder, you really have no idea what you're talking about. You, you look like a person that has never earned a living in his life. Now, if you lived in a place like Oklahoma where we had... I live in Montana. Them. Huh? I live in Montana. Well, uh, but if you had ever lived where there was oil, like Oklahoma. There's no oil in Montana? Uh, there's probably oil in Montana, yes. But you see, we don't, do that. we don't do that anymore. We haven't built a refinery in 30 years. The reason we haven't built a refinery in 30 years is because of the EPA and OSHA and all of these other... Uh, organizations that have come up to keep to keep us from developing our own energy resources. And I can uh, assure you that regardless of what the, the resources are, soon they will ban uh, fertilizer put on the ground in order to grow more corn because we cannot grow our way out of this. 
we need to drill. We have drill. How many people do you think go to Anwar and see that that wilderness up there? There's not one person out of every 100,000 that ever sees that. And why don't we take advantage of the resources that we have and use them and forget about the oil companies making money because they're going to. That's why you get in business. Now, did you write that book to donate all of the proceeds of it to charity? No, you didn't write that book for charity. You wrote that book for you. And you're taking every cent that you can get out of it, and you're using it yourself. That's called capitalism. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, that was an interesting, uh, interesting diatribe. Um, let's go to the Anwar question first. Uh, uh, the idea that, that Anwar will, will get us off foreign oil. Well, here's your government. Here's what they say, that if we opened up Anwar, we would, America's dependence on oil would go from 62% to just 60%. Uh, if you want to know how to use our resources, how about fuel efficiency standards? Fuel efficiency standards, our own government tells us, would produce as much oil savings per year that Anwar has in its entirety. So that's the first question. Uh, uh, the, the, the issue of refining capacity. Uh, we heard another myth here that it's all the environmental regulations and oh we should feel bad for the oil companies. Boy, I, I feel real bad for the oil companies. When in fact in my book you will see documented internal oil industry memos which show that the oil industry has deliberately limited its refining capacity. Memos between executives saying we are going to limit our refining capacity in order to boost prices. And Consumers Union, a nonpartisan watchdog group, well respected on both sides of the aisle, reports that, refining, that, that the refining capacity issue is responsible for at least 30 to 35 percent of this, the spike in oil prices. So before we go off into some wild theory about environmental laws parroted from, from a right wing operation, let's remember what the facts are. The refining capacity in this country is being gamed. It's being gamed to make sure that companies like Exxon make $8 billion a year. Next up is Batesville, Mississippi. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all gentlemen doing? Good. Thank you. Yes, I think he, he knows exactly what he's talking about, unlike the gentleman from Oklahoma. Well, anyway, uh, gas here is like $3 a gallon. Anyway, the average person in Mississippi, minimum wage makes five fifteen. How is we supposed to make it? with gas this high? That's, that's my only question. I'll just call it in. That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, the minimum wage uh, has reached a 50-year low. Uh, Congress refuses to, uh, to raise the minimum wage. We hear all sorts of lies about how the minimum wage is supposedly going to hurt the economy. My favorite lie that's told is that the, the minimum wage is going to drive down job growth. Of course, there are studies that have consistently shown that states that have raised their minimum wage actually are adding jobs faster than states that haven't. Uh, whenever the minimum wage comes up for a, for a vote, we get a proposal like we saw last year from Senator Rick Santorum that purported to raise the minimum wage, gave Republicans a way to vote for it, pretend that they were supported it. Meanwhile, that bill would have actually eliminated minimum wage protections for roughly uh, 8 million workers. So we see, again, Congress in the pocket of big money interests uh, uh, and no con consideration for the kinds of situations you're talking about. High gas prices, low wages, Congress in the pocket doing nothing. In terms of big money and corruption, is one party better at it or bigger at it than another party or is it more a situation of the party in power versus the party out of power? I would, I would argue that we've always had one big business party in this country and we always will have one big business party in this country. Uh, I would say the problem is how have we reached a, a point where we really, I would argue, have, are undergoing a hostile takeover of the whole government. Well, I would say it's because we have about one and a third or one and a quarter big business parties, that a quarter to a third of the Democratic Party is part of the problem. And that has allowed the entire debate to shift radically towards corporate America's wishes. So. I guess in terms of, of percentages, I would say there are more people within the Democratic Party in Washington who are fighting the hostile takeover than there are within the Republican Party. But again, I think we need to get out of the paradigm of red and blue, Democrat and Republican, and realize that what the real paradigm is, is folks with money that have enough money to buy a seat at the table and folks without it. And the people with money in a system that, that forces politicians to run 
by being financed by big money is going to skew towards big money and not towards the people. Next up is Lockport, Illinois, on our line for Republicans. You're on with David Sirota. Hi. Hi. Uh, let's see. I have a book here written by Buckminster Fuller. It's published about 1980, and it's called Critical Path. And in that book, he discusses foreign aid money. Now, foreign aid money, supposedly, according to Fuller, has strings attached to it. If, if you send the foreign aid money overseas, it has to benefit a U.S. company. Not only the, the com country it goes to, but it has, has to be spent with on U.S. products. So one of the things that happens, uh, I understand, is you could close a plant up here in the U.S., and like, we'll, we'll say company X, and it can move overseas, and the U.S. government, under the guise of foreign aid, will build company X, a new plant overseas. I've called my representatives on this. I've called uh, senators. I've written newspapers. No one will give me an answer if this is still going on. I, I, I can give you a, an answer that, that's, that's, that's in the same realm. Um, uh, this book doesn't touch uh, on the foreign aid question, but it does touch on job outsourcing and our government's support for it. Let me give you some examples of how our government is spending your taxpayer money to help to help outsource jobs. Uh, you may recall that uh, that back uh, two years ago, the White House actually issued an official government report uh, endorsing job outsourcing. President Bush signed his name to it. Uh, you might recall a, uh, a bunch of stories about a year and a half ago about how the administration was holding forums across the country uh, at hotels like the Waldorf Astoria in New York, uh, encouraging companies to move their operations uh, to China. And perhaps worst of all is a little thing called the Export-Import Bank. This is a bank funded with billions of dollars of your taxpayer money. Uh, it's supposed to be going to subsidize companies uh, who are marketing their products overseas. What we end up finding out is that it's subsidizing companies that are simultaneously reducing their jobs here at home and increasing their jobs overseas. That is, outsourcing their operations. Bipartisan legislation was brought forward uh, to stop subsidies that go to corporations that are eliminating their U.S. workforce and increasing their, their workforce elsewhere. That bipartisan legislation was voted down. The fact that it was voted down should be everything you need to know about what our government really feels about job outsourcing in this country. David Sirota, born in New Haven, Connecticut, grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs, now lives in Helena, Montana. How does a guy from the East Coast end up in uh, Big Sky Country? Well, I, uh, I worked for Brian Schweitzer in 2000 when he ran uh, against Conrad Burns for the U.S. Senate. Uh, he was a farmer, first-time candidate, uh, and I had a chance to go out there and work for him, and we, we remained good friends. And uh, come 2004, he decided to run for governor, and he he asked me to come out for the uh, tail end of the campaign, which I did. I served as a strategist to, to, to Schweitzer, and he became the first Democratic governor in that state in 16 years, in the same year that the state uh, voted 60% for George Bush. So after the election, uh, my wife and I decided that uh, we'd like to, uh, to have an adventure and, and move out to Montana, and it's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Back to the phone, San Saba, Texas. Go ahead. Hello, uh, good show. Uh, thanks for the C-SPAN. Uh, I was a relief pumper in the 70s when uh, we had that oil shortage. And at that time, uh, the government would allow you to pump as much oil as you wanted to. 100% uh, allowable. And, uh, but the first, say you had a well out here, and it made 300 barrels of oil a day. Or a month, or whatever. But, uh, the first hundred barrels that well made, they pay you ten dollars a barrel. Then the second hundred barrels that that well made, they pay you eight dollars a barrel. Third, third was six dollars. If you make three hundred barrels, so uh, what the pumpers would do, they'd go out there and they'd pump that well and they'd get a hundred dollars, get the first hundred barrels and shut that well down the rest of the month, which created the shortage. That well had could have pumped three or four hundred barrels. Of oil, but it just created a shortage. So the oil company tax created a shortage then. There was no shortage. I, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, and I have a section in my book about what, what's actually causing price spikes. And, and as you'll see in the book, uh, uh, it shows that, that the fluctuations in prices don't really have anything to do, uh, at least in the short term, 
with crude oil prices. Uh, again, it has to do with artificial shortages. Uh, there was a study done by Consumers Union, again, uh, about, uh, about California uh, about a year ago, about why their gas prices were going up. And the study showed that it had everything to do with artificial shortages, This, in this case created by, by artificial uh, bottlenecks in the refining capacity. But I think the issue is we need to get out of uh, uh, thinking only in terms of, of oil. I think we need to ask more fundamental questions. Why is our government, after experiencing the shortages of the 70s, why are we not focused on more uh, sustainable policies? Why are we not really focused on raising fuel efficiency standards? Why are we not focused on, on developing alternative sources of energy? Why, why was Jimmy Carter, for instance, ridiculed uh, 25 or 30 years ago for talking about this stuff, and then we didn't do anything, and now we're sitting here at the same, at the same place? The question for us is, are we going to allow a corrupt government to let us languish here in this same place for the next 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years, or are we going to finally say it's time to end both America's addiction to oil and Congress's addiction to oil money. Mountain Home, Arkansas, you've got the last question for David Sirota. Yes, please excuse me, I'm a little nervous. You're fine. Uh, I want to just start off with, uh, I want people to get off this one person who's our president. I want them to get off his back. Uh, everything is his fault. The outsourcing of uh, b uh, business to other countries started a long, long time ago, not during uh, George Bush's uh, presidency. And also, uh, uh, during the Carter years, we were, I was missing days to go to work. I had to drive 45 miles because I couldn't get gas. There were gas lines. We, we were running out of gas at the stations. But I believe the People should be allowed to uh, um, drill in uh, Alaska, and and uh, it is something that the uh, senator from Alaska uh, wants. The people of Alaska want this. The reason why we don't have oil refineries enough to refine the, the crude in our country is because. Uh, uh, is because the environmentalists have been preventing this this uh, sort of things to happen. Thanks for your call, ma'am. Uh, it really shows the power of the propaganda system that's out there. The idea that it's in radical environmentalists who are creating the oil crisis. I mean, that is absolutely unbelievable that this is, this is out in the culture. I, I, it's not unbelievable if you accept the fact that this is being peddled by our government very deliberately. It's being peddled because the oil industry has a lot of money to make sure that politicians continue to repeat this malarkey. Again, if you look in my book, you will see the facts from our government that show that this is not a problem of environmentalism. This is a problem of oil industry price gouging. David Sirota, author of Hostile Takeover, Big Money and Corruption and How Big Money and Corruption Conquered Our Government and How We Take It Back. Thank you for being on the program. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching this edition of the Washington Journal. We go live now to the House of Representatives. Corruption conquered our government and how we take it back. The, reading through this book, how surprised would people be to see that, um, in, in your opinion, uh, that there is big money in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? Well, I don't think people will be surprised. I think that what they will be surprised about is how deeply rooted corruption really is. As, as I argue, you know, we tend to think of corruption as Jack Abramoff, Duke Cunningham, uh, and the scandals that we read about in the paper. And as the, as the book makes the point, that, that corruption really is far deeper than that. The worst forms of corruption are what's legal, what's happening every day. Uh, uh, in fact, I would actually argue that corruption is even how we frame the debate. So, for instance, uh, uh, on energy policy, uh, as, as, as gas prices hit $3 a gallon, as, as ExxonMobil reports $8 billion in profits while they're giving their CEO a $400 million retirement package, up until very recently, the terms of the debate have been essentially what tax breaks to give to what energy companies. Up until very recently, any policies that would actually challenge big money, in this case big oil, like a windfall profits tax, like a federal price gouging law, 
that's been out of the debate. And so I would argue that it, that's out of the debate not accidentally. It's deliberate. It's deliberate from a Congress that is in part owned by the big oil companies. So if um, there is nothing illegal, no price gouging or anything like that going on, how does Congress get involved with ExxonMobil, for example, who wants to give their retiring CEO a $400 million retirement package? Well, uh, two ways. First of all, I'm not sure that there's nothing illegal going on. Uh, I, in the book, I document how internal oil industry memos in the late 90s and early 2000s showed that the oil companies were trying to uh, uh, limit their refining capacity in order to create artificial bottlenecks. So have we seen a, a serious investigation into that? No, we haven't. Have we seen a, uh, a, a consideration of a windfall profits tax? That's a way to, to try to rein in uh, uh, price gouging through a windfall profits tax. I think, you know... Or the voter has an opportunity to take advantage of the market. They always change the rules, like the free market in employment. Okay, when, when, when the demand for labor is high, then they let the uh, immigrants come across. They change the rules all the time. Uh, they'll say uh, free market in, in oil. Well, once it was regulated, they said we're going to deregulate it. Then they change the rules all the time to cut down the supply. I mean, if people don't see this here, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost obscene what they do to they, they change the rules, but it's always the free market when it's the advantage for the corporate, uh, off, uh, uh, the corporate enterprises. But when it's time for the consumer to take advantage of the, uh, the environment, the, um, I mean, the, uh, the uh, uh, financial environment, it, they change the rules every time. I would, I would tend to, I would absolutely agree with you, and as my book goes into, one of the great myths uh, in this country uh, pushed by big money interests is that we actually live in a free market. Uh, here's a part of my book which actually goes into exactly this question. Uh, in one breath... By David Sirota, who is the uh, author of Hostile Takeover, and before we get into the uh, book, we want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what uh, Hugo Gurdon was talking about, and that's K Street hedging the bets on the outcome of the next election in 2006 and 2008. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's not surprising, uh, as, as my book goes into, that the, the corruption on Capitol Hill, the influence of big money on Capitol Hill, crosses both parties. And so uh, I think that, that the overt nature of K Street uh, uh, moving a little bit towards the Democratic Party is not that surprising, because they haven't necessarily divested themselves fully of Democrats, even though there was the K Street project. In other words, that that they're reasserting themselves with the Democratic Party, I think, uh, uh, shouldn't be shocking because I think big money has always played an influence and continues to play an influ influence on both parties, regardless of the high-profile nature of the recent corruption scandals as focused on the Republican Party. The name of the book, Hostile Takeover, How Big Money and Corrupt... Have we seen even a discussion about really repealing already passed tax cuts for companies like ExxonMobil. Well, we saw it. It lasted about three days. Now we're not talking about it again. Why? Again, because companies like ExxonMobil have a huge amount of discretionary money to throw around Washington to make sure that these policies never get debated. We're talking with David Sirota, author of Hostile Takeover, uh, How Big Money and Corruption Conquered Our Government and How We Take It Back. And uh, we want for you to, uh, we'd like for you to get involved in the conversation, and uh, we'll show you the numbers on the screen in just a few seconds. First, we're going to take this call from Columbus, Ohio, on our line for Democrats. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I agree with you. There's big money in both parties. But the Republicans seem to be op. I mean, just obscene with the manner in which they allow the abuse to be, take place in government. And I want to get to a couple of points. They're always talking about the free market, the free market. But once the consumer 